Each evening when the Dharma talk starts. Each evening when the Dharma talk starts. Remind yourself you're not here to listen to the talk, you're here to meditate. Give 99% of your attention to the topic of your meditation. And think of the talk as a fence. When your mind wanders off, it runs into the fence. And the purpose of the fence is to remind you to go back, not to go any further away from the breath, further away from Bhutto, whatever your topic is. Don't let the talk get in the way of your meditation. If it, the topic is relevant to what you're doing, it'll come right in without your having to send your attention outside. If it's not relevant, let it go past. In the past, when people were listening to the, the Buddha talk about the Dharma and gain various levels of awakening, it wasn't because they were focusing so much on what he said, but they were using his words as pointers to what was going on inside their own minds. They saw what he was talking about as it appeared in the actions of the mind. So instead of focusing on the arrows that pointed to the minds, they focused on the mind itself. And that's how they're able to gain insight, gain awakening. So try to bring that attitude to the evening talk. For as you meditate, there's a lot to pay attention to. The quality of alertness means both being alert to the object of your meditation and alert to how it's going. And John Lee compares it to a, a belt on a machine. Pulls one direction and pulls the other direction, back and forth. In other words, you focus on the object and then you turn around and check to see if the mind is solidly with the object how it's doing, what the results are you're getting. And then you go back to the object again. This way you can monitor your progress. And also, you learn how to read your meditation. When things are going well, you don't have to worry so much about checking up. Just stay with the object. But if you find that you have trouble, And you've got to learn how to use your ingenuity and to figure out what the problem is and how you can get around it. And John Fuang used to say that when he was teaching meditation, many times people would come to him with problems that he had never had in his meditation. But he found that those seven steps in a John Lee's method, too, were a good checklist. If your mind has trouble setting down, settling down, ask yourself which of the steps is missing. You don't have to think of them so much as sequential steps, but as elements that should be present in a good, solid state of concentration. Your ability to stay with the breath, to have a center. Experiment with long breathing, short breathing, or long in, short out. Short in, long out. Being able to spread the breath to the different parts of the body. First off, just be sensitive to how the process of breathing feels in the different parts of the body. Down your back and your shoulders. Do you tend to tense up your shoulders when you breathe? Do you tense up your chest? And where is a good place to focus? Ask these questions so that when things aren't going well, you know what you've been doing and then you can know what you might change. If you're focusing on the head and it's making you dizzy or giving you headaches, well, focus further down in the body. Or focusing further down in the body makes you sleepy, bring it back up. When 
you breathe in, does the breath energy seem to go down your spine, or is it coming up your spine? Which feels better? If one way doesn't feel comfortable, just think it's possible for the energy to go in the other way. You don't have to push it. You don't have to force it. Just allow the thought to open that possibility. And you'll be surprised at how much the body can respond simply to the power of thought. Do the different parts of the body seem to be working together as you breathe in, or are they working at cross purposes? Again, through the power of thought, say, let's be coordinated here. See what that does. If you have trouble staying with the breath, there's a passage in the Canon where the Buddha says if focusing on the body creates a sense of dis-ease or you have trouble staying with the body, find a theme that you find inspiring. Focus on that instead. And this can be more discursive. Sometimes it's simply just repeating the word Bhutto over and over and over in the mind, thinking of that quality of being awake. Or you repeat any word that you find inspiring to repeat in the mind. That's not especially discursive, but sometimes there are discursive themes that can be helpful. Because remember, you're, all, you're bringing an attitude into the meditation. You're bringing, many times, your life narrative. And if the narrative doesn't seem to be going well, it's hard to drop it. What you've got to do is go back and stitch together a new narrative. The themes of meditation called recollection of generosity, recollection of the precepts, recollection of virtue. In other words, you think about the things that you've done in the past that have been good, times when you've been generous. If you're bringing a negative narrative and it tends to focus on the foolish things you've done, and we've all done foolish things, and sometimes it seems like the only real things in the life in our lives are the foolish things we've done, and the good things seem to be false. But that's that's a skewed perception. And focusing on the mistakes we've made in the past and getting depressed about them. It's really not helpful, because when you start focusing on your own negative activities, and after a while you get tired of focusing on your own negative activities, you start focusing on the negative things that other people have done as well, and that puts you in a downward spiral. spiral. So try to think of some of the good things you've done, the times when you've been generous you didn't have to be, but you were, the times when you held by your principles, even though it was really tempting not to follow them. Another good things you've done in your life, so that you can bring a good narrative to the present moment. This kind of discursive thinking is in a, can be an essential part of the meditation. Because otherwise you try to bring if you're bringing a negative narrative, it's hard to let go and actually be in the present moment. Because part of you feels that that negative narrative is, is, the, is the truth about the past. And then by coming into the present moment and somehow trying to create a sense of well-being here, you're being false to the truth. That creates a conflict inside. To remind yourself that you can stitch together a totally different narrative from your past actions. And it's just as true. Another inspiring theme might be gratitude. Think of the people you're grateful for, the help you've received from other people. The people who make you feel that the human race isn't actually a good place to be. It's interesting that when the Buddha introduces the doctrine of karma, he doesn't focus on past bad actions, the punishment that's going to come with the 
the bad consequences of the mistakes you've made in the past. He starts out with the topics of generosity and gratitude. The fact that we are responsible for our actions means that generosity and gratitude are valid emotions, valid activities. They really do have worth. If we didn't have freedom of choice, what would there be to be grateful for? It's like being grateful for a stone to drop for dropping. It drops not because it made any choice to drop, simply it's it's what gravity does. It makes stones drop. Generosity again wouldn't have much meaning. But the fact that we do make choices in our life, this is what means this is what allows generosity and gratitude to be good activities to be really worthwhile. So think of things that put the mind in a positive mood, so that it finally is ready and willing to come into the present moment and put the good narratives aside so you can focus on the present moment. You've been fortunate enough to find a way of training the mind. means you've done something good in the past. As the Buddha once said, this is the sign of a wise person realizing if you really want to be happy, you, you, you realize you've got to train the mind. You see the value of training the mind. Foolish people don't see it. They feel, well, happiness has to come from gaining this and getting that. depends on things outside being in a particular way. The wise person realizes that true happiness comes from being able to deal with whatever arises skillfully. And that's the kind of training we're working on here, learning to be mindful, learning to be alert, learning how to read our own minds, learn from our past mistakes. Notice the Buddha never says, never make a mistake. He says, if you make a mistake, this is how you learn from it. You resolve not to repeat the mistake. You don't let yourself get tied up in remorse. Just remember that next time around you don't want to repeat what you've done. And at the same time, you try to develop attitudes of goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. Learn how to develop those for everybody. This is another inspiring theme that you might want to work on if you find that you have trouble settling down in the present moment. Trying to develop these attitudes so that you can call on them whenever you need them. So as to push back the limits that the mind tends to place on itself. And then when you develop those attitudes to your mistakes, i.e. admitting the mistake but not getting tied up in remorse, realizing that getting tied up in remorse can't go back and change what was done in the past, that your duty is just to remind yourself, keep the mind in good shape so that it doesn't get in a position where it's going to make that mistake all over again. If you get wound yourself with remorse, a wounded mind has trouble not repeating mistakes. So if you're feeling there's trouble bringing the mind to the present moment, stop and ask what attitudes the mind is bringing to the present moment that make it difficult, and learn how to undo any skillful, unskillful narratives and work on developing the skillful ones. Skillful narratives that yield in the person realizing the need to train, train the mind to bring it focused on the present moment, to find true happiness within. And then you realize, here you are. Ready to meditate. It's like that story John Lee tells about when he was a young monk and was thinking of disrobing. He went up and sat in the 
the jetty at the monastery there in Bangkok. It's okay, if I were going to disrobe, what would happen? And at first he created a narrative in which all kinds of good things happened. Here he was, a farm boy gets to marry a, the daughter of a nobleman. But then reality hits. Daughters of noblemen tend to be pretty gentle creatures, frail creatures. Anyone who's going to have to be his wife is going to have to work, bear children. Then in his narrative, the daughter of the nobleman dies, leaving him behind with a child. So he hires a wet nurse to look after the child, and after a while he marries the wet nurse, who's good to his child for a while, but then she has a child of her own. Then things start getting difficult. He begins to realize his pay, his salary is not going to get any more than it is at that point. And every time he goes home, it's just three different stories about what happened. The wife's version, the first child's version, the second child's version. He's, oh my gosh, I wish I'd never disrobed. And then he reminds himself, hey, I haven't disrobed, I'm still a monk. So his narrative brought him back to the present moment in much better shape. So learn how to create your own narratives that bring you back to the present moment in better shape, ready to meditate. As long as the mind is going to think, let it think, teach it how to think skillfully. Make your thoughts your allies as well. We talked today about having the breath as a friend, as an ally. Well, sometimes it also requires teaching your thinking to be your ally as well. It's all a part of training the mind.